So listen, there's so few of us for the moment, for the moment, that what I'd like to do is just have everybody introduce themselves so that, you know, we have a conversation as we go along. But then as the presentations go, they'll come from here because we're going to be covering this in video so that we can share it with other people. So this is our first meeting of 2019 for the capital chapter of the Physicians for a National Health Program. We have approximately uh, 140 members here in the region, and we were having our regular monthly meetings up through June. Uh, and then because of what was happening in the legislature uh, and what was happening at the national level, we uh, recessed having these regular meetings, and now we're going to start again every month. So we have a major meeting set for April, a major meeting set for May, and they will continue uh, in large part through the summer and beyond. Um, as you know, the California Bill 562 was essentially ended at the end of its two-year session uh, without any action because of the uh, uh, censure of the Speaker of the Assembly, who stopped the bill from being referred to its proper policy committee, despite the fact that it passed out of the Senate. And the reason for that uh, is, 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 was given that the bill was incomplete and did not explain how it was going to be paid for, which should not have been an issue until after the policy committee, because in the policy committee, we would have been able to define the scope of what it was that had to be paid for before we figured out where the money would necessarily come from. We had, as you know, a comprehensive study that was done by Amherst, by uh, Robert Pollan, that explained in, in three different models exactly where this would come from to outlaw the private insurance industry and the essential savings from comprehensively covering every single body resident in the state of California would have saved $37 billion in the first year just in California. Uh, the technical issues of how we would deal with the barriers that had to do with uh, the various technicalities and bureaucratic issues that would allow Medicare and Medicaid and CHIP money to come back to the state of California from the feds and the hostility from the feds in relationship to California moving in this direction are issues that we're going to be de dealing with. The governor has uh, decided as soon as he became governor to change the bill that was going to establish a council, a five-person council, three people of his choice, one from the Senate, one from the Assembly, from a study for looking at the pathway towards single payer to an actual uh, effort to nail down how we're going to make it happen and only single payer make it happen in California. What's going on at the federal level, as you know, is that this new wave of discussion that's happening in the Congress is so rich and so evolving and maturing in terms of how the, the discussion is being engaged that the question of where the candidates running for president are going to be on the issue of universal comprehensive health care is going to be a very dynamic and a very articulated uh, uh, agenda from what we're going to see, and we will have a major opportunity to be part of that. You know that the Physicians for a National Health Program is probably the single most authoritative organization in the country in terms of defining costs, defining policy, and defining what the problem is in the current delivery system that is such a burden and such a trauma to so many people in America, regardless of whether or not they have their coverage or whatever. So what I wanted to open up today was to begin a conversation to look at the various different policy areas that are completely marginalized and invisible in relationship to the real discussion of what a healthcare system would look like and who are the stakeholders. Because there is a knee-jerk response from big industry against single payer when big industry would be the largest beneficiary and essentially open up the possibility of a much more competitive market for our industries 
absent the burden of having to deal 20% with health costs, medical costs, which are not health costs, they're med absence of illness costs in the marketplace. As you know, the marketplace is totally, completely out of control. There is no law that controls what people get paid and what people can charge from the hospital world, from the pharmaceutical world, and from the insurance industry. And the creation of that middleman community essentially rips out 30% of the total dollars that are currently going into getting people to not have illness, which is not the same as getting people to be healthy in a healthy, productive society. So today is the beginning of opening the conversation into areas that are completely invisible, not discussed, not clearly understood by three principal stakeholders in the agricultural economy. One of the major growers in the state of California that grows virtually everything except citrus and has been in business his whole lifetime with his family. One of the most experienced farm worker organizers who's been working in the field since she's been eight years old and is working with organizing farm worker women, not only in California but throughout the nation, and the principal intellectual policy worker in for the Assembly Agricultural Committee to whom anything that happens in hearings is the backup person that's got to translate and, 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 and essentially return back to the committee the decisions that are made in terms of legal language, legal analysis, and advice and support for them. So grower, corporation, farm worker, policy, I think are the three major blocks that essentially look at this thing. And the purpose here is simply to just get a handle on some of the scope of what it is that people are struggling with and how this whole question fits into their lives were they to understand clearly the enormity of the solution that is going to, going to be achieved in the next five, six, seven, eight years. No question about it because the inflationary expansion of costs is absolutely not uh, uh, meetable at this particular point. So. I want to start off with Frank uh, Mullen, Muller, I'm sorry, who uh, I just met and, and runs one of the most diverse and interesting uh, farms in Northern California. He grows everything. He grows wheat, rice, tomatoes, cucumbers, avocados. He grows uh, oil, olive oil, I mean everything. He hasn't gone into the cannabis industry yet, but I have no doubt that sooner or later you know, he's going to be forced into growing some of that at some point just to kind of be part of the market. Um, Frank works out of Woodland. Uh, he is one of the principals in his family organization. And uh, he's been appointed to the California Department of Food and Agriculture as one of the members of the board of directors. So not only is he an experienced on the ground worker, real organizational worker given the history of his family, but he's also now in a position, and I'm sure he's probably struggling with that, to be a major a participant in the decision making and the discussions that go on because of the pressures, international, global, legal, policy, uh, logistic pressures that, that, that are imposed on a, 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 an operation as large as his. After that, I, I'd like to have Millie Trevino Saucedo uh, talk to you, who is uh, just an absolutely remarkable human being. I mean, I've had just a few minutes to really talk with her, but this is somebody really who's an angel, and an, an, an organizer angel, who's got a long history from being a child around the time when uh, Cesar Chavez was organizing the United Farm Workers to uh, the present time where she's now putting together uh, not only the founder of a thing called the Alianza Nacional, de Campesinos, but she was the founder of a farm worker organization uh, that uh, is called Lideras Campesinas. And she has a master's degree that she got from Antioch uh, in uh, oral history and women's leadership and uh, has been recognized because of her salutary work by everybody on earth, you know, in a very special way. And then the third person in the room 
that I want to be able to weigh in is Viktor Frankovich, who is the principal consultant for the Assembly Agricultural Committee. Um, uh, he's been doing this for what, 13 years? Uh, 10 years on the committee, 15 years before that. It's a lifetime of competent you know, attention to a group of people that are constantly turning over. And so you got to understand that it's the Victor Frankovich's of the legislature that maintain the status, you know, of what's happening. You know, and every assembly committee and every senate committee has a peer of his or more that essentially are behind the scenes dealing with the situation. So before we kind of jump, let me just have everybody introduce themselves, and then Frank, if you would just take over. You can see that this doesn't amplify too badly. This is all being videotaped, and we're going to essentially share it with as many people as possible when it's all done. So, my, my name is Bill Bronson. I'm a physician and the chair of the Capital Chapter of the Physicians International Program. I'm the medical director of two state departments in California, and this is my life. My life is before I die, and I just turned 80 the day before yesterday, uh, to essentially make sure that everybody has health care as a right and that the agony that people are experiencing is ended in my lifetime. Victor Frankovich with the Assembly Agriculture Committee, as stated, I've been with the committee for two years. I've been the primary consultant for the last uh, two, 10 with the committee, and then previously worked for a member in an ag district for 14 years. I'm Lauren Leon Perry, and um, I'm I'm retired uh, from about 40 years of working in healthcare, in uh, preventive medicine, health promotion, and performance improvement at Kaiser, in a prepaid system, and at Marshall Hospital up in Placerville. So I've worked on improvement in from the inside, and so in my retirement, I've decided I need to work on it from the outside, and have gotten involved with. Um, expanded and improved Medicare for All. And I am part of an organization called El Dorado Progressives. Believe it or not, we live up in, I live up in the foothills in Placerville, and we have about 2,000 people in our county who are part of our group. And we're in the process of offering house parties throughout the area. We're trying to work with the Chamber of Commerce, uh, with the local physicians groups to help um, bring dialogue and community conversation around the issue of uh, what's going on with our health care. That's kind of our theme that um, brings people in quite well, and uh, so that's that's what we've been doing. Jim? I'm Jim Barrett. I'm a retired family physician and retired for about three years. Um, after having my nose to the grindstone for about 35 years, when I finished my residency, I spent two years as an officer in the public health service on the Hopi Reservation, and 20, uh, about 10 years of old-time family practice, uh, a private practice, and then of course with the HMOs that merged into corporate health model, uh, and had the opportunity to work in a uh, fairly qualified bill health clinic that was run by the, you know, the patient we went to and tried the glucose, so I did that for 15 years. Got a taste of rural medicine there. and. Um, so that's become somewhat of my passion in the same way. I've been inside those to the grindstone for so many years, and now they have all the time to look at the broader picture. And uh, I have concerns about rural health, hospitals closing, people not having to travel too far. The patients you know, want to have them get physical therapy. I don't have the gas money to go to that town to get physical therapy, so you end up writing a prescription for a beef pill. Anyway, uh, I'm convinced that if we can get everybody on board with, with insurance and prevent the disease, that will be the, the cost savings. Shiv? I am Shiv Bhatt. I practiced as kidney specialist for two years in a VA hospital in Kansas. Then I moved to California, practiced as a kidney specialist in Mustard, California for almost 30 years. Then uh, quit that practice and moved over to Rockland, Roseville area. My son has started his own uh, 
kidney specialty clinic there. And he has a group there. And he put me to work uh, for six years uh, on a part-time basis that you can't be retired. <laughs> so after that, I completely retired. And about 12 years ago, you know, I started thinking about this, uh, our current health uh, insurance mess we have. And I saw all the changes in the insurance system. When I started practice, majority of the health insurance companies were not for profit companies. And it was not very difficult to get paid for the service. One by one, in the early 80s, they went to Wall Street and became shareholder companies, public shareholder companies. And I immediately started seeing this mess. Their only interest is making as much profit as possible so they can please their shareholders, especially the biggest shareholders, which will make their share price go up. And when the share price goes up, the CEO gets bigger bonus, millions of dollars in bonus, all these things. I started seeing this and it was affecting the ability of my patients get, getting insurance coverage, affording it, and many of them were unable to buy drugs so pay for the insurance and many had to go without insurance. I saw all these things. And in our own practice, I found this pre-authorization and all kinds of things uh, for anything. You know, in those days, even to get a CT scan, I had to get pre-authorization from the insurance company. The only two insurances that I did not have to call for pre-authorization or anything were Medicare and Medi-Cal. Those were the only two where I had no hassle. But these private insurance companies were only interested in making profit and they did not care for their patients. They gave us as much trouble as possible. Doctors suffer too. Doctors, doctors suffer too. Yeah, doctors suffer. Elaine? And uh, so eventually I quit that practice mm. and moved here. What happened was I made a mistake of not continuing enough. When I had practice, I had my own insurance for me and my family uh, through the, my practice business. And that business was closed, and I could have immediately continued the insurance as a, what do you call that, Cobra? Cobra. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I did not do that or guts or whatever in the process of moving. Six months later, I realized, oh, I don't have insurance. I have insurance. <laughs> wow. Called my insurance agent. He tried to get insurance. Because I have been a diabetic for 40 years, they kept denying every company. Denying shiv, insurance. shiv, shiv. <laughs> Let, let's just introduce. We'll, we'll come back to the story. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, so. You have coverage now? Yeah, no, in, the, in that process, I found out about this PNHP physician for mm. National Health Plan mm. that advocates for single payer. I immediately paid my dues and joined it, started advocating for that. I have been active in PNHP ever since. And uh, of course, now I'm a Medicare age and I'm on Medicare and I have no problem with You've done to be 65? <laughs> I'm 75. <laughs> That's my yeah, story. Thank you thank so you. much. Uh, I'm Elaine Silver, and um, I'm a physician, retired. Uh, the last 30 years I worked as a Kaiser physician, internal medicine. Before that, uh, I was actually, um, I'm from Canada, and was trained uh, medical school in Toronto. And we had a um, national health plan, actually it was a provincial plan uh, for the, my first year in practice in 
Toronto, which was very smooth. It was effortless, you know, because there was no problem people being seen. And then when I worked at Kaiser, similarly, I wasn't aware of too much hardship until uh, one of my patients who was in his 80s and been coming to see me for years and years uh, was told he could no longer come to Kaiser because he was outside the area. He lived up in Pollock Pines. And, and I was horrified that he could just get cut off that way because I felt like he needed me. I am, I'm the only one that really knows you and all your health problems. And then uh, after I retired from Kaiser, I started volunteering at the free clinics that are run by the medical students. And that's where I really began to see people who had no coverage, who had uh, no source of care that they could afford, and, um, and began hearing more and more stories of, about even people who are insured but are underinsured or, or get destroyed by a, a major illness that leaves them without their job and without care. So uh, I, I'm very aware of how messed up the system is. And I actually resent the question of, of how much this will cost because we, this country wastes so much money on, on things like uh, jets and bombs and military. We can afford to take care of people. And I don't care if it costs more than, you know, people like myself pay taxes and I'm very happy to do so. And that's, that's my bias. We can, afford, we can afford. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Cordero, and I've been working as a, you know, hospice nurse. You know, and, 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 and you know, I can see the differences between you know, people with insurance, no insurance, cobra, no cobra. You know, and and I was assisting with the consequences, <laughs> and now um, I'm just helping to farm workers. Um, Women's in California organizations have been, you know, in too many ways, and I'm happy for that. Thank you. Welcome. You just flew up from Burbank? <laughs> Did you just come up on the plane? No, no, I have a, uh, you know, family here. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mili Trevino Salceda and um, uh, Dr. William, as they call him. Uh, <clears throat> already introduced part of uh, what I'm going to be uh, saying, and uh, I do come from a migrant farmer family, and uh, living the different issues that farmers live in terms of being migrants, in terms of not having places uh, to live at the time you're migrating, or uh, because you're a large family and you get paid very low, or it's seasonal work, etc. Uh, you're always uh, trying to uh, survive. And uh, so for the same reason, uh, se the, several of us didn't go to, um, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, high school here or in Mexico. Uh, some of my, sh my siblings were born in Mexico. Um, I, I just want to say that um, I did work in fields ever since, like Dr. Williams uh, was sharing, uh, since I was eight years old, before and after school, weekends. Um, uh, but then as a teenager, I just completely was not going to school at all. And so it was very hard. Not until I was uh, my 30s, I, I, I said there's no more justification for me not to go back to school. So I went back to school and I learned I was smart. <laughs> but nonetheless, I was already organizing with the United Farm Workers in the fields, but then I felt it was very important that we organize in, within the community because there was a lot of work. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, I, I feel more about, um, for me, it, it, the importance of organizing at work is, is only important when there's abuse. Uh, because if, if uh, companies do the, the right thing, then, you know, it's doing the right thing. And uh, so workers get get their share, they're working in a healthy environment, that's fine. But if they're not, then that's when uh, workers can can learn about um, uh, being respected. That's, that's our concern. Um, uh, 
and uh, I'll talk a little bit more later. So my name is Frank Muller, and I, <coughs> thank you very much for, for inviting me here tonight, and thank you for embellishing my resume. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know I did so much. And it's interesting when you talk about all three of us that are lost and Larry. I grew up on a farm. I grew up as a farm worker in a large family. Um, we were the workforce for my dad. Uh, I can remember working in the fields and feeding calves and cows when I was five years old. So I, I know what it's like to work hard and, and grew up that way. Um, we have a, 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 a big farm and um, it's, I, I want to answer your question a little bit there too about, about cost not being a concern. I'm a businessman and so I do, I, I understand your point, but I want to make sure I get some of my points across. And I'm going to refer to my notes. I apologize for, for referring to my notes, but I'm, I can talk all day long about my farm, but this is, has some context that I want to be able to bring up and make sure I hit on tonight um, with some of these notes. So yeah, we have a large, a large farm. It was a small farm when I got out of college. I'm a graduate of UC Davis. My dad um, is an, uh, a Swiss uh, immigrant, so I'm a first generation American, proud to be a first generation American. My dad's kind of lived the American dream. Um, and at one time or another, I'm one of six kids, and we've all been involved in the farm um, at one time or another. It's down to one brother and I and my son and, and a nephew. Um, and where we went from farming just a couple hundred acres when I graduated from college, it's, it's several thousand acres. It's a big farm. We had one employee when I, when I first started. I, this is my 40th year. Our farm has been there for 52 years in Woodland, California. Um, so we've grown it to where from one employee to over 100 employees today, um, 40 year-round full-time and, and 60 or so seasonal workers. Um, and this is, you guys are not ag people, and I want to kind of give you a little bit of an ag background, uh, just to, ag is a huge industry in California. Ag, California ag is the number one ag state in, in the United States. A lot of people don't know that. We have, there's over $50 billion of farm gate revenue produced in California. We grow over 400 different crops in California, and we're the world's leaders in many crops. We grow 80% of the world's almonds. Um, Two-thirds of the fruits and nuts in the United States come from California, and we're the, the leader in dairy, in to pistachios, almonds, walnuts, tomatoes, and you go right down the list. This is a, a wonderful place to grow crops. We have this amazing climate, infrastructure, soil, workforce, research facilities, and so California, the Central Valley of California is the jewel of the world. It's people all over the world come to the Central Valley of California to see what we're doing and how we're doing it. So on my farm, like I said, 40 year-round employees, 60 seasonal um, uh, workers. My workers, I don't consider the seasonal workers to be migrant workers. A lot of them live in the community. They'll work nine, ten months out of the year, take a couple of months off. Um, a lot of them will work a few months at the farm and go work for processing facilities, rice mills, and stuff like that. So um, uh, my workforce has... They, re they come back every year. I have a very little turnover in my workforce, and the reason for that is my farm is known as a good place to work. Um, we've always had uh, health insurance for our year-round full-time people. We have a profit-sharing plan, retirement plan that I fund 100% of for my workers. They have performance bonuses, dental care, the whole works. We treat them as professionals, and we ask them to work like professionals, and they are. Um, I'm really proud of a lot of these guys. I'm um, proudest of one of our workers' son, Ian, who just got a full-ride scholarship to USC as an academic scholarship. We have uh, employees whose sons are doctors, attorneys. Um, they're very smart guys. They just didn't have the chance to get educated, um, it, but their sons and daughters are, are, are very accomplished in a lot of cases. So the reason I'm here is that there is a crisis in rural health care. Um, I believe the solution starts on my own farm, and we've taken steps to, to try and be part of the solution rather than be part of the problem. So I want to talk about before the Affordable Care Act and cover California and then talk about after because kind of a, a, a pre and after that, that's important. Um, I hate health insurance. It's the worst day of my year is when I meet with my health insurance. This is where, before the ACA um, because the rates went up. If it, they didn't go up at least 10 percent, you were happy. And, and I'm, I'm working in a business that I, I, I'm a price taker. I can't raise my prices because it just doesn't work in agriculture. So if my costs go up, I've got to figure out a way to offset that somehow. So we did like what a lot of employers did when the rates were going up. We kept the insurance, but we kept slashing the coverage. So deductibles went up, co-pays went up, prescription costs went up, and it got to the point 
where my workers had insurance, but they weren't using it because they couldn't afford the copays, they couldn't afford the, the out-of-pocket expenses. So a lot of them were using emergency room services or they would only use it when there was a crisis or for acute care. And, and it was a shame. I'm paying a third of a million dollars a year for this coverage and they weren't using it. So we did something that was kind of counterintuitive. Um, the, the health insurance was, we didn't charge uh, the employees a contribution at all, and we decided to charge them a contribution every month. It seems counterintuitive that, well, they're not using it, but you're going to charge them. But the reason we did that is because they realized that there was a value to having this health insurance. It's not, a, we didn't charge them very much, but there was a nominal fee per paycheck. And some of them said, we're going to drop the insurance, and a couple of them did. But when they realized that would they didn't have it, they, they came back and said, oh, I'll pay this, and they started using the insurance where they just took it as kind of a for granted thing, and they realized there was a value to it, and we had a lot better buy-in. But nonetheless, there's still the problem of the co-pays and, and um, the, the access. Um, so the reality is a lot of them, when they needed some heavy work done, needed something done, they'd go to Mexico and have it done. And, that, and that's kind of a shame when they had health insurance, but it was cheaper for them to go to Mexico. So then the ACA came along. And I've always considered the ACA and Covered California um, health insurance reform rather than health care reform. It was, it, it was just a different way to do insurance. Um, it was the biggest single pain in the butt that I've ever had as an employer. Um, the compliance issues with, with Covered California were unbelievable. And I, I don't have, a, I have two people that work in my office, I don't have an HR department. I don't have someone that specializes in, in, in taking care of these kind of issues. So the, the people I had in the office had to gear up and, and do these functions that they never um, had to do before. And I got them involved in this conversation that I'm having tonight, yesterday, and they got very animated, my two office workers, and said that they felt like the program was put in, Covered California was put in to catch people doing something wrong that rather than to provide better health care for people. Um, and they have a whole bunch of examples and I can share a couple of those. Um, but the reason, um, one of the biggest issues with, with it was the sticker shock, okay? And I, I'm already paying a third of a million dollars a year in health insurance costs. And when I went through the numbers, it looked like my health insurance costs were going to double. And that's pretty hard to pay a, out of my pocket another $340,000, $330,000 a year. So we went through all the rules and regulations and we set up um, our program to discourage our uh, seasonal people from accessing uh, covered California because it simply was not affordable. And a lot of them were able to comply with uh, um, Medi-Cal or get you know, other ways. They, they got the uh, um, tax subsidy. Um, some of them took the subsidy but didn't get the insurance, and so it turned out to be a mess and kind of created a little bit of a contentious relationship in a few cases that because they, the employees always want to blame the employer for something that's going wrong, and it, and, it, and it worked that way in a few cases, but the results of the Affordable Care Act didn't increase my participation except for about three or four people that took insurance for me. That's about the, the whole effect of it. In addition with agriculture, and I think this is really important, the immigration status of uh, our employees, um, every employee that I have is, has the proper documentation to work on my farm. Whether that documentation is real or not, I can't tell you that. I can't ask because that's discrimination. So I have to take the documentation as a given. But it, what it does is precludes a lot of these employees from wanting to seek um, the, uh, uh, to sign up for something because they're afraid that, that it's going to come back to them. And I think if you look at the Dreamers thing that's going on right now in one administration, they wanted the Dreamers to sign up, and the next administration that comes along, the Dreamers are afraid that there's, they're, that's going to cause them some problems. So it's kind of the same thing with the, with, with the health care. They, they, some of the employees were just worried about going and, and signing up for something because they were all of a sudden exposing their immigration status. Um, Again, my, my job um, as a farmer is about controlling risks and, and controlling costs. There's a little bit of farming that goes in there, but as the business part of it, risk is a huge part of my business. And, um, and so I have to be really conscious of, of what all these programs are costing. Um, I never really saw the benefit of the ACA because of the complexity and the bureaucracy. Um, and again, it only resulted in a few of my employees um, 
seasonal employees getting insurance. So I say this as someone who voluntarily provided health insurance. I don't think that an employer should be required to provide health insurance by the government in the way that the ACA and Covered California did because it created a triangle between the government, the employee, and the employer. And then you throw the insurance company in there and it's the fourth part of a triangle if that works. Um, but it, it just added all this complexity. And um, reporting requirements, tracking, all of those things are just a really big pain for an employer. Um, there's these forms 1094 and 1095 that we have to fill out. There's 25 boxes of codes that you have to fill out in 10, form 1095. And not one of these boxes says that the employee was offered a qualified plan but turned it down. And that's the most important question. So we are currently have been fighting a fine of $26,000 that we were um, fined three years ago because we've turned in all our documentation that everyone that was qualified that turned it down, yet there was no box to check. And, and so it just created all this contentious stuff between us, the government, the employees, and, and, it's, and it's a mess. So the third of a million dollars that I pay in health insurance costs is about 7.5% of my payroll. And I've read some of this stuff of what, it's, what a payroll tax would do if you did a, a universal plan, or, um, and it's somewhere 8 to 10%, so I'm not that far off. Um, and uh, again, getting back to your cost question, so as a business person, this isn't the only cost that I'm facing, right? I've, all, all these things going on. Um, we're currently struggling with the ag overtime laws that just came into effect, AB 1066, is completely changing the way our farm is working, and the minimum rising minimum wage with SB3 um, causes concern. Um, I don't have many people that aren't at the $15 an hour rate anyway, even though it's not going to kick in until 2022, because that's just it's a competitive environment out there with the 3.5% uh, unemployment rate right now. We have to raise uh, wages for people to keep them to work there. So those are my facts, and I'll share a couple of my opinions. I think everybody else is doing that tonight, so I'll share my opinions. I, I believe that um, I support change in access for health care in the United States. I believe health care is a basic right. I think the pre-existing conditions should never preclude anyone from, from seeking health insurance. I'm a fan of a single-payer system, but I do believe if you're ever going to get this to, to people to buy in, we need to have some kind of secondary buy-up that people can have. Because the biggest argument I hear from my um, colleagues is, look, I work hard. I, I want to pay for the best insurance. So if we all have some kind of basic care but you could buy up from that, I think you get a lot better buy-in. Um, I am scared, again, as a business person, um, and I, I tell you all this with some caution because I, I'm afraid that California is going to institute our own plan and it's going to put us at a competitive disadvantage once again. California is always already the, one of the really high cost places to do business and if we are paying for health insurance in California, no one else is in this country and I've got to grow crops that someone else can. It puts us at a competitive disadvantage. Um, another competitive disadvantage. It's not the only competitive disadvantage. But, but I do believe in a national health care because everybody's you, you get this thing called leakage. If you only do it in California, people will, the high earners will move from California. The businesses that can move will move from California. So I think we need to be, be uh, co cognizant of that. And um, government is not always good at delivery. So if we're going to do this, we, get, we need to do it in the right way. Um, because I can't afford as a business person to have, once again, my costs go up two or three or four times. And I think that scares a lot of people. So it has to be done right. And I do, I do believe if, if it is done right that it's not going to cost me more money. It we shouldn't. Don't have to reinvent the wheel. I agree with I mean, you. I'm not talking about the cost to you as, a, as an employer. I'm talking about the cost to the people of the country where the rich people pay more than I, 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 I agree with you 100%. I'm just trying to get my point across as a business I person. And, and I. I'm picking on you because you said that, but uh, um, but but it's just, so, uh, um, but so it, as a business person, I have to be aware of all this, these these things. It, like I, I can't control my my prices or what I'm what I'm getting, so I have to control my costs. So I have to be very cognizant of that. And um, but I do I do believe we need some change. I, I'm disgusted that my workers who have health insurance don't want to access that health insurance. And I'm still our rates even under covered California. 
the rates are still going up. They're not going up as bad as they were, but they're still going up. So we do need change, and, and that's why I'm here tonight. Great. So, all right, thank you. hear me good all right okay um, what I'm here to do is to share with you uh, the different issues farm workers face and go through uh, one because our family lived it uh, one of the only things that we did not go through only because of my profile um, I look um, many more times especially when I have my ponytail I look more uh, Latina than right now um, uh, and when I do, uh, a lot of immigration, Im immigrant, immigration uh, officers stop me just because of my profile. But uh, I've had my issues there. But I'm a U.S. citizen. Um, uh, the majority of the people that we work with uh, uh, are farm workers, uh, farm worker families that are undocumented. That means that they don't have their legal status, and that means that they are constantly afraid and hiding, uh, much more with this kind of administration that we have, um, and uh, much more that uh, just, I don't know if it happens in your farm, but um, it does happen in, in many farms are, are across California and the United States where workers, uh, if they start at 530, many more times they would come around 5.15, 5.20 before starting. And with this administration, workers try to um, leave their homes. Uh, if they're an hour away or half an hour away, they try to um, uh, get there uh, like an hour before so immigration will not have to um, follow them. Because if they know the, the path where uh, workers go, Sometimes, you know, there's, they're there. Um, so at the same time, as because of, it, it's gotten worse with this administration, and I can, I can, I can say many things in terms of health, health issues. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the things that, that um, uh, uh, Mr. Mueller talked about are, are, very, are very relevant to what um, we have been concerned in terms of health. Um, yes, workers prefer not, 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 it's not necessarily because it's a choice, it's, it's more of if uh, workers uh, on an annual basis, uh, farm workers are earning between uh, 11,000 to uh, 13,500 annually. Uh, how can they afford for to pay uh, medical uh, services? And if uh, the, the, the two parents uh, get to work, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, women farm workers earn the same. Uh, we have found that um, women earn uh, two to three thousand dollars less than the male workers. And uh, there, and we know a lot more times, uh, and I'm just going to concentrate in California, because if we go to uh, other states, uh, I can say that uh, many, many pharmaco women still work under <coughs> their significant others, uh, Social Security, whatever Social Security they're using. So it's one Social Security per uh, uh, couple. And that means that uh, the majority of the time, women are invisible. Um, so that means that the earnings might seem a little bit higher, but it's two people working for the same Social Security. So, um, and then in terms of uh, the housing, the housing issues, the housing issues are, are issues that, um, that uh, in its majority, it's not just the high pay, especially here in California, it's very expensive. 
uh, the rental, the rental pay. Uh, we see many families, and I'm talking about three or four families at a time living together in a household uh, because they try to uh, 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 make sure that they're trying to survive. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm talking that there's families that have two to three children. Uh, there's some families that are having larger amount of, of children and that makes it a little bit harder and health-wise that's not a good thing, especially if uh, they're living in apartments of two bedrooms and you have three families living together uh, or you have, and they're, they're expensive. Um, uh, so if there's health issues, of course, the same as Mr. Muller was talking about, uh, many families prefer to go if they have the documentation or if they don't, they ask someone that goes across the border to get the medicine and bring it to them. Sometimes they, they self-medicate themselves thinking that they know uh, when the majority of the time they don't. Um, so these, these are some of, some of the issues. Um, because, because um, uh, yes, there is workman's compensation that by law here in California exists. Every employer has to have, is obligated to have a workman's comp. Um, but that doesn't mean that the worker in the agricultural, in, in most agricultural in, uh, uh, companies, um, a lot of the workers don't know that they have that insurance uh, that they can apply to. And, uh, and if, if some of them do know, um, uh, they're afraid to file a complaint because they don't want to lose their job uh, or because they might feel that they're going to be fired or because they might be feel, feeling that they're going to be blacklisted or um, uh, they don't understand the system. They come from a country that they might not have, uh, doesn't exist or might come from another uh, state that they're, this might not be exist in existence because um, like I said, California might be the, the very few states that do um, uh, um, require employers or companies to have um, uh, this kind of insurance. Um, in terms of, as I said, because of the immigration status, we do have um, uh, the, the organizations that I, I co-founded, uh, Leaders Campesinas, which means Pharmacal Women Leaders, here in California, and the other one is the national, but I want to focus here in California. Um, we have found uh, that many, many uh, health issues with pharmacal women working in the fields. Uh, we think uh, workers, we think um, uh, uh, of them, we think about health like, every, like if everything is the same when the situation, uh, Women's uh, health is very, very different. Um, uh, as I, as uh, Dr. Williams was saying uh, earlier, yes, uh, my family went through uh, pesticide poisonings here in California. Of course, in Idaho, and we didn't understand what was going on, but here in California, when we learned about the law, um, it was a little bit after being sprayed several times. It wasn't just our family, it was a whole crew. Um, and uh, the company, even though the workman's comp was supposed to be there, um, we, we had no idea about our rights, so we didn't know we could complain or anything like that. And I, I got to see um, several women having issues, and uh, one of them, like my mom, much earlier years, uh, she lost a pregnancy, and then uh, a woman uh, being pregnant while she was working and after, two weeks after that, uh, one of the poisoning happening, um, she was, um, she delivered the baby, but she, her health was so bad, deteriorated, that she died. Um, uh, it was, it, and it, it, that has kept it, I was a t a still a teenager when that happened. And for me, it, it was like, oh, it's, it, 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 it just, I just don't understand why uh, people, people's lives uh, are taken this way. And um, uh, there's many, many other things that I can be talking about. Um, and, and, and when I say about women's health in the workplace, um, or just 
women's health in general, uh, we never think about reproductive health. We only think about how uh, uh, um, many companies are not, maybe, maybe not necessarily the owners or maybe just the middle people that they use um, uh, are, are very negligent in terms of how they um, apply the chemicals um, uh, to the point that um, even though California is one of the one of the, uh, because it, it's got uh, <clears throat> the industry, the agricultural industry is, uh, is the largest here in the nation, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Miller was talking about. Yes, but if, if you see how much pesticides are used in California compared to any other state, it's the state that uses millions, millions of, of, of um, tons of, of um, of chemicals that many more times we don't know what it is because and even though uh, the law says that workers should be told when their spraying happens uh, and there's some at a certain amount of, of time where uh, workers cannot go in into the fields uh, workers are taken in by the crew leader or the supervisor and workers not understanding because there's a lot of chemicals right now that don't have any order and because they don't have any odor, then it's just people going in and then uh, having all these kind of symptoms and not understanding that they're being poisoned. Um, but at the same time, um, workers uh, don't uh, don't know what to do, don't know where to go, and if they go to a doctor, many more times these doctors are not prepared or do not want to get in, engaged. In, in these kind of situations. So they tell the worker that it might be um, a symptom of food poisoning or a symptom of uh, any other, maybe allergy or whatever, and they give some kind of antibiotics that are not necessarily <laughs> um, uh, good for the, for the, for the, for the health of, of that uh, worker. Um, I, 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 there's, there's a lot a lot of other things that I, I'd like to talk about in terms of health, but um, one thing I wanted, I, I, and the reason why I, I invited Elizabeth is because of, of what she really understands. I remember when, while working in the fields um, um, in terms of having eye problems, um, it's not just the sun, it's the dust and the chemicals uh, that when you're working uh, uh, especially, as I said, uh, the majority of the, 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 um, the work I did as a teenager here in California was citrus. Uh, I was like a monkey, like my brothers also, you know, uh, using the ladders, uh, running up the ladder and trying, because we, we, we would do peace rain. And, um, and all this dust uh, at a point in time, the, yeah, the odor was very strong and uh, we didn't know what it was. But um, it was getting into our face our, and into our body and not understanding we, we were being poisoned at, at the time. But with time, I started, um, uh, if, if I would have continued working in the fields, which um, as a young adult, I started doing other kinds of jobs. Um, if I would have continued, I think, um, uh, as, as some other workers that I've known, uh, would have lost my sight. Uh, because of the, the kind of chemicals that were being used um, uh, while we were working. And um, uh, uh, our family worked in the fields when DDT was still uh, being used, and you all know it was banned. Um, many other chemicals are being banned, but then the companies, um, uh, chemical companies, because they want to keep selling, they, they, they use other names for those kind of chemicals, or they use other kind of whatever products. Uh, related to that chemical um, because uh, they convince uh, companies it's important, um, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it, I've, I've, no, I've, I've noticed that in terms of my family, uh, uh, the, the loss of hair is, is something very uh, prominent, um, uh, not just uh, hair in, in your head, but hair and around your body. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, other issues, but they're not taken care of because um, we're invisible. Is we're a very invisible population. Um, 
only us, uh, uh, we feel that are the ones that we don't voice out these kind of concerns, then um, first become visible so that people can understand that we are here, that we're human beings. And um, I do want to commend Mr. Mueller for everything he was saying, that he was worried about his workers. And, and very few I can, I, can, um, I can deal with. And just because of all the things that we have gone through and I, all the things that I've seen workers have gone through, there, there have been um, companies where workers are being, were poisoned and, uh, and I'm talking about south, the southern part of uh, counties of California, where workers, when they were sprayed, they were taken across the border by um, supervisors because the companies did not want to deal with the hassle of. And um, I saw that, and no one told me. Uh, I, I would then go meet with some of the workers on the other side of the, of the border, and I would find out that these situations, I'm talking about the, the, the part of the 70s, part of the 80s, that a lot of that was happening. Then I didn't, I didn't do that. I didn't continue doing that kind of work because then I went back to school. Um, uh, I did everything I, I needed to, to do. It took me a while. It wasn't easy to go back to school because uh, not, not having um, school during my, my years when it's much easier to develop that, uh, the vocabulary and everything else. Um, but um, I, I can only say that um, uh, when it's very easy for workers to really understand and if you have a if you don't if you have a very high, very low turnover of workers, that means that you you must be doing good things. And believe me, when I was uh, um, when I was recently married um, and about to have a child, um, I did work with a company that that company was a good company. And and my husband during that time with that family did um, keep most of his of their workers because it was a company that afforded or wanted to pay their workers. Uh, they were fair. The only thing that they were not fair was when I was pregnant, I was fired because I was pregnant. Uh, maybe the discrimination in terms of uh, gender discrimination was, was, very, was there, but um, in, in terms of how uh, this, this family, along with many, it was like a uh, seven uh, different crew uh, of workers, we would all come back. We would all come back. Why? Because we know when the, when, when the, the employers are, are, are trying to do the best for their workers, um, they don't see the workers only as objects, uh, only as you know, the means to get their, um, get their products and get their um, uh, uh, profits. So um, uh, so I wanted to ask Elizabeth, and she's got maybe two examples uh, that uh, she will want to share with you about some of the things that I was talking about. Thank you. Well, I'm going to be, you know, fast. You know, um, the most common, you know, illnesses for farm workers is, uh, at least we know, is uh, four of them, see? It's in a muscular. Uh, osteo problems, uh, COPD, skin problems, and and sometimes you know people is asking why you know farm workers job is similar to bodybuilders, and why? Because uh, and then also you know some people say well it's kind of a boot camp, you know exercise they repeat and repeat and repeat, you know lifting, you know pulling and bending. You know, running sometimes, so it's kind, kind of, you know, of all of that. But like, for example, you know, bodybuilders, bodybuilder, they start like one hour, two hours, the most four hours, sometimes three days per week. See, and for farm workers, it's every day. And and in some companies, is uh, you know. Um, eight hours plus overtime, see? So you can imagine. Um, a lot of them, you know, uh, they don't use special, you know, shoes, like for example, construction workers and things like that. 
and sometimes the soil is wet, so what's happening, you know, see? It starts with uh, any problems, joints, lumbar back, chronic pain, you know, and, um, and it's one of the consequences. And, um, well, and, um, you know, in COPD, most of the problems, you know, with asthma, as uh, Milly said, you know, sometimes it's uh, a consequence of pesticides, can be allergies. And, and one of the big mistakes, you know, uh, through all of these years is bad diagnosis, you know. In the emergency room, when people is taking um, the medical, you know, information, they never ask what kind of uh, chemicals you are exposed, you know, when you are working in the field, see? But anyway, if they are asking, sometimes they say, well, it's pesticides, but they don't recognize the name of the chemical, see? So we need to do something about it. And something that I see, you know, through the last years is more psoriasis and eczema. See, it's more than dermatitis, you know, so I really don't know, you know, what's going on. And, and, and one of the problems for women is an extra, you know, points because um, uh, pregnancies, you know, is uh, premature, you know, babies, kidney infection. Why? Because it's hard, you know, to go out for urination. Toilets are far away, see? And then also, uh, what about the menstrual, you know, situation, you know? Um, they don't have time to be changing the female, you know, um, tampons. So it, it, it's some of the reasons that uh, I'm concerned as a woman, because some of them, they start using, you know, uh, diapers. Believe it or not, so it's crazy, don't you? But that is going on. And then also something that I see is uh, the situation that um, sometimes the toilets, that is an ambulatory toilets, are not clean enough. Or sometimes they, they don't have a soap, you know, to wash the hands. So it's better to be careful with that. And, um, you know, in, in one, something that I see is um, um, auto diagnosis. Oh, you know what? I'm feeling pain here. Maybe it's this. You know, that's happened with my father. That's happened with my grandma. And just go to Tijuana or somewhere in the border and you can buy some medication, you know. So it's an auto medication. And, and it's incredible because that's uh, not happening only, you know, in, in the south border. That's happened in Alaska. That's happened in, uh, by the east, you know. Like for example, Caribbean people is using medication from Cuba, Puerto Rico, you know, places like that. And in Alaska, it's a Russian, you know, medication coming, so what's going on? And one of the confusion is, um, most of the people think uh, farm workers are coming from Mexico. No, we have people is coming from Argentina, Colombia, you know, uh, South America, Central America, from anywhere, see? So it's, it's just the uh, concerns that we have as a women's and um, and we need, you know, the opportunity, of course, for better medical services. And something that I was talking is some people is asking me, do you know about, you know, free clinics? And, oh my gosh, you know, sometimes what I know in Ventura County, because I'm coming, you know, from Ventura County, uh, is Salvation Army. 
But we have the situation in this moment for homeless, you know, people, and it's full of them. So it's no places anymore to go. So I'm agreed, you know, that we need to do something about it. And, um, and more than nothing, you know, to be attend as another human being, um, you know, farm workers, with compassion to prevent illnesses, because doesn't exist any more programs to help, see? Um, in this, you know, I, I have an example, like for example, now, it's hard, you know, to be a self pain You know, it's the consultation plus uh, the prescription, you know. Through Cover California, a farm workers needs to pay 5000 per year, see? And that is talking about silver. It's more, it's another program, you know, gold and platinum that forget about. And, um, in this month, we celebrate um, Campesinos Month, and then also uh, the celebration for Cesar Chavez. And the legacy is always telling us, he say one day, you know, every time you and your family sit together to enjoy food as fruits, grains, vegetables, remember all the people is behind men's, women's, and children's, picking the produce. Okay, thank you. Beautiful. Well, how are we gonna take this shit? <laughs> <laughs> You're asking an ag consultant, not a medical consultant, so I'm yeah, not sure. This isn't a medical <laughs> problem. <laughs> this is not a medical problem. So, well, I'm gonna start with what I normally start with. Frank's told some of my, uh, uh, my t material that I use, but I always like to tell everybody that California is called the Golden State because of the gold rush. But during the time that the gold rush took place, what the, the 10 years, they pulled about $170 billion worth of gold out of the ground at that point in time, adjusted for inflation today. At that same time in California, what is it? Uh, they grew roughly $900 billion worth of food, again, adjusted for inflation. So my terrible pun is uh, California started as a place because there was gold in them, there are hills, and they went and they stayed because there was gold in them, there are fields. So uh, that's my last pun I won't use anymore. California, what is it recently, has become the fifth largest economy in the world. Uh, the state's economy success has been attributed to financial services, real estate, technology industries, largely based in urban and coastal regions. Left out of this economic success story, or left behind a bit, is the vast rural regions of California. California's rural population makes up about 5 to 10 percent of the population, depending on how you count it, and covers roughly around um, 90,000 to 110,000 square miles. That's roughly 54 people per square mile, as opposed to most urban areas where there's about 4,200 people per square mile. That leads to some of the issues that we have in uh, the rural areas uh, accessing a wide variety of things. California area, uh, what is it? Um, uh, the, e e the economies are heavily based on n uh, natural resources and working lands um, and provide valuable resources, uh, what is it, uh, commodities to all Californians, in including food, water, and open space. But these areas have the issues of higher poverty, higher unemployment, um, less health care, more health problems, more obesity more heart disease, um, every imaginable disease you can have is worse in the rural areas. And it's a wide variety of things. Um, part of it is the access, the distance between places, um, the economies of the area, and um, uh, just what the pay is. Uh, average pay in uh, rural areas is roughly about 75% for a family income of an urban area. Um, and that impacts a wide variety of things. When you talk about the cost of health care being $5,000 a year or $7,000 a year, that's a much bigger impact and portion of uh, income in the rural areas of California than it is in the urban areas, um, depending on the, the population we're talking about. Um, with the small populations in large geographical areas, California's regions are often overlooked. Um, one of the things that we 
end up in a lot of these discussions having uh, that I spend a lot of my time doing is trying to talk about to urban members about rural California and agriculture. Uh, Frank mentioned how what is it the farm gate value last uh, what is it, in the last year recorded was 54 billion dollars and we are the most uh, prolific state in the nation and have been for the last 60 years. We supply about 12 percent of the um, uh, world's food supply uh, when you look at it in that respect. But with that Agriculture, what it makes about two percent of GDP in California, and it makes two percent of the popul and it's and it's done by about two percent of the population of California, and so it's overlooked by a lot of urban centers and uh, what is it, urban folks, because of that. In the rural communities, agriculture makes up about forty percent of the GDP in some counties, um, on a varying degree. It's extremely important, and what is it, and needs to be figured out how we continue going forward and trying to make sure that the system works. Um, or that, um, uh, like I said, part of, a lot of the time what I do is try to uh, do outreach to urban members, trying to get them to understand how ag impacts their lives in their, uh, the areas of the state that they, do, uh, that they look at. But they don't pay attention to it because they don't see it. Um, and because of that, we end up with a wide variety of the, the, what is this, like I said, the economic difficulties and, again, the health care issues. Um, Policy-wise, um, that's one of the problems that we, what is it, it comes into the same issue uh, with a larger urban population, which means more urban legislators, a lot of the policies are driven towards the, greater, the, the larger populations in the state. Um, and again, uh, the rural areas of California end up feeling like they're being left behind or not being paid attention to. Um, if you look at the spread of hospitals, uh, I think in what is, in, uh, what is it, which considered rural California, there are 34 major hospitals. And for the population, that's a fair amount. But the distance people need to travel for that is incredibly far. And if you're on a limited income, uh, you don't have good transportation, uh, you're not going to be able to make it there as well. There are a lot of clinics. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, there's about I think 270. Uh, uh, what is it? Low-income clinics and rural clinics in, in the rural area of California. But again, compare that to the urban areas where you find closer to what is it? Um, 5,000. It's just uh, a disparity that's hard to overcome. Um, so, uh, what is it? Uh, how we reach that and how we do that will probably be done as we go forward with using a lot more things like telemedicine, but for that we're going to need better broadband and better technology. Um, we're probably going to be seen as, what is it, as the um, various different requirements in agriculture, what does it become more strict in California, which they have over the years. We're probably going to see a trend towards more mechanization. We've already seen that in the last couple of years with more folks looking at that. Again, to be able to have that, we're going to need a trained workforce who can work with those products. And we're going to be able to have to transfer a lot of the agriculture workers we have now into those kinds of jobs. And if not them, their children. And there is work that we're doing on that. And so that this transition that we'll have to go through to be able to get uh, to a point where um, it's not as economically behind uh, is difficult. So. Kind of what I have. I was going to more open up for a lot of questions because, again, the uh, I know you keep saying it's not a medical issue, but what is it? It's not an expertise there. The, the, the health side of it's not an expertise point I have. Okay. So. Thank you very much. You just what a what a remarkable spectrum.